Hello, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all her ships at sea. The Wright Brothers, Eddie Rickenbacker, Lucky Lindy, Howard Hughes, Amelia Earhart. America loves its aviators. The real-life exploits of these fly boys and fly gal have captured the heart and imagination of the American public. It's no small wonder that the larger-than-life adventures of fictional aviators would find their way into people's homes. During the golden age of superheroes, one fictional aviator was a household name, being tops in radio, movies, comic books, television, newspapers, and toys. His name? Captain Midnight. <laughs> Captain Midnight made his debut in the fall of 1938. He started as a syndicated radio show, but was quickly picked up nationally by the Mutual Radio Network. Captain Midnight quickly spread out to other mediums. The popularity in the character wasn't just a reflection of the American public's fascination with aviation, but a reflection for the love of flight by the show's creators. Writers Robert Burt and Wilfred Moore loved aviation. Their love of flight began in the early days when airplanes first took to the skies. The two Kansas City natives became pilots and found themselves in the 28th Squadron during World War I. The American 28th Squadron was attached to the British Royal Flying Corps and flew low-altitude bomb and strafing runs. After the war, they returned to Kansas City and became writers. Moore worked the sports desk for the Kansas City Star, and Burt sold aviation stories to pulp magazines. It was at a party in 1933 when the two came up with the idea of a dramatic radio show about an aviator. WDAF was a Kansas City radio station owned by the newspaper that Moore worked at. The station was looking for programming ideas. The adventures of Jimmy Allen began on the airwaves of WDAF in February 1933. It quickly went regional, then national. The Adventures of Jimmy Allen was the story of a young aviator and reflected the fine American ideals of resourcefulness, courage, and capability. The show also featured the fine American ideal of capitalism, with early merchandise tie-ins such as a Jimmy Allen balsa wood model airplane and a weekly flight patrol newsletter with a readership boasting over 600,000. The Adventures of Jimmy Allen would last until 1938. That year, Burton Moore took their writing talents to the city of Chicago. The ad firm of Blackett, Sample, and Hummert picked up the writing team's new radio show concept. They got the Skelly Oil Company to sponsor it and WGN of Chicago to air it. The Captain Midnight radio show was syndicated throughout the Midwest and West Coast. The show was recorded at the Blackett, Sample, and Hummert studios in Chicago. Blackett, Sample, and Hummert was one of the leading producers of radio programs in the 1930s. The program was recorded on special glass recording discs and mailed out to radio stations for playback. Each episode was about 15 minutes in length and usually aired on weekdays between 5 and 6 p.m. During the golden age of radio, 5 o'clock was considered the kitty hour. This was the period after school and chores and just before dinner and bedtime. One of the reasons why Captain Midnight became so popular was that the show didn't just appeal to children, he appealed to the whole family. Moore and Burt's writing continued with the fine American ideals they established in their previous radio show. However, their scripts were now being guided by the Blackett, Sample, and Hummert ad agency. They were known for producing radio soap operas. Ann and Frank Hummert were the creative dynamo behind the radio studio. They liked solid storytelling and strong, competent female characters. No damsel in distress stories. Captain Midnight was a kid's adventure show, but it took on many of the qualities of an adult program. Captain Midnight is actually Captain Jim Albright, a World War I ace who returned from a secret mission on the stroke of midnight, thus earning the code name. The captain returns to the USA and fights crime with his airplane, and his flight patrol made up of Chuck and Patsy. Often they found themselves up against the criminal mastermind Ivan Shark and his evil daughter Fury. The Captain Midnight radio show was picked up nationally by the Mutual Radio Network in 1940. The show also picked up a new sponsor, Ovaltine. Ovaltine recently dropped the Little Orphan Annie show. 
They outright purchased Captain Midnight, keeping Moore and Burt on as the writers. But the recording facility was changed to the studios of WGN. Ovaltine's advertising and marketing people brought with them the experience of sponsoring and promoting national radio shows. They changed the Captain's Flight Patrol into the more exciting Secret Squadron. They also expanded the show's merchandise tie-ins. What came out of this was one of the most sought-after promotional toys of the 1940s, the Kodograph. The Kodograph was a small badge or disc made out of brass. On it was a dial that could be used to decode a secret message using a simple substitution cipher. At the end of every show, the announcer would ask the kids to break out their Kodograph. And now, to the airways. Stand by. The Secret Squadron signal station is on the air. And the first thing, we have a thrilling secret code message from Captain Midnight. It's an exciting clue about tomorrow night's adventure in Master Code Number One. So write that down. Code number one. And here's the message. All right, the first word. 16. 23. Sometimes the message was about eight, the episode, such as Shark Sets five, Trap or They Are Safe. Other times it was a command ten, to drink more Ovaltine. Regardless of the message, kids and adults love this. Right, Ovaltine had experimented with the Kodograph with limited success during the Little Orphan Annie show, but with the Captain Midnight show... The decoders were in high demand, and the only way to get one was by sending in the wax top seal from a bottle of Ovaltine. During the war years, the Kodograph was even in higher demand because it was made out of brass. The manufacturing of them was suspended. Brass is the metal used to make shell casings, and every ounce of it was needed to fight the Axis. To the lament of many a child, countless Kodographs were turned in during scrap metal drives. New ones would not be made until the war's end and figure out the secret message about tomorrow's adventure. And listen regularly for more of these exciting Secret Squadron signal sessions. In the fall of 1941, Dell Publishing began printing a comic book version of Captain Midnight in the pages of their flagship title, The Funnies. 1942 was a big year for Captain Midnight. Patriotism was at an all-time high after Pearl Harbor. Captain Midnight flew to higher altitudes with the release of a 15-part movie serial by Columbia. Newspapers carried a daily and a Sunday comic strip. Big Little Books featured the captain, and the radio show moved to the NBC Blue Network, with the production of the program eventually moving to New York City. Fawcett Publishing took over his comic book adventures in the summer of 42. They kicked off his feature title with an amazing cover, with the captain being introduced by the original Captain Marvel, who at the time was outselling Batman and Superman. The comic book was quickly scooped up. Unlike the other mediums, the Fawcett comic deviated from the radio show. At first, Cap was your typical aviator, but after a few issues, he was given a glider chute that gave him the ability to fly. With the war's end, Captain Midnight's popularity waned. People were tired of war. Patriotism and sacrifice were set aside for a sense of peace and calm. Interest in the radio show spiked briefly when the new Kodographs came out but NBC let the show go. It went back to the Mutual Radio Network in 1945. The Fawcett comic went into a different direction. The principal writer was Otto von Binder. He was a sci-fi pulp writer, and as the war was ending, he took the comic book into a science fiction direction. Both the radio show and comic book came to an end in 1949. Ovaltine sponsored a TV show in 1954 on the CBS network. This time, Captain Midnight was updated to being a Korean War jet pilot. It was produced by Screen Gems. Production lasted only two seasons. The show was in rerun until 1958 when Ovaltine pulled out. Audiences had become too sophisticated or too lazy for Kodographs. Screen Gems renamed the show Jet Jackson and took it into syndication where it limped on for a few more years. America's interest in aviation continued as man went into space, but Captain Midnight was put away and forgotten. Like most of the Golden Age radio shows, Captain Midnight was a product of a past time. In 1990, the Sandoz Company purchased Ovaltine and they officially canceled the Captain Midnight trademark, basically giving the character away. Dark Horse Publishing acquired the copyright, and in 2013, Dark Horse Comics relaunched a Captain Midnight comic book using the Man Out of Time storyline. 
How many times have you fellows and girls listening in said to yourself, Gee, but I wish I could meet Captain Midnight sometime. He certainly must be a swell guy to know. Yes, I'm sure you've often wished you could meet Captain Midnight. Well, sir, I've made arrangements for you to meet him right now. In a personal interview, direct from microphone to you. Here's Captain Midnight himself. Hello, fellas and girls. Say, this is a treat. I've been wanting to talk with you for a long time. First, because you young folks are my favorite kind of people. Second, because I have something very important to tell you. It seems to me that nobody quite realizes how important you young folks really are. Now, here's what I mean. In just a few short years, you fellas and girls will be grown up. You'll be the generals and the admirals and the ace pilots. You'll be in charge of the government and of big business, of everything in the world. You fellas and girls sitting there in front of your radios tonight, you're the leaders of the future. You're going to run the world of tomorrow. It'll be a challenging job, a mystifying and exciting job. Why, well, I say, it's like standing alongside of a great big shiny brand new super airplane, having somebody say, step in, buddy, right up into the pilot seat. Tomorrow, you're going to start flying this thing yourself. Yes, tomorrow, you young folks are going to be running this exciting new world. So you certainly want to be ready for that job, don't you? You want to be so healthy and rugged, packed with courage and pep and stamina, that you can take over the job like veterans. So here's what I want to suggest to you. Be sure you get the right kind of food every day. The right kind of food to make you as strong, husky, and alert as you can possibly be. And that means, above all, drink your Ovaltine every single day. Drink two or three glasses of Ovaltine every day, and eat three good meals with some citrus fruit or tomatoes. Now, if you'll do this, you'll be as husky and fit as food can make you to be the leader you want to be in the new world that's in the making. Thank you, fellas and girls. Happy One last thing about Captain Midnight. Unlike the other heroes who fought fictional battles against the Axis, Captain Midnight had an actual impact on the war. When the U.S. entered World War II, many Captain Midnight listeners joined up to become airmen. Whether they became pilots, flight crews, or mechanics, this was the first opportunity for many of them to be near airplanes and many jumped at the chance. More than a few of these young airmen brought their codographs with them for good luck. The ones who didn't have luck were shot down and had to bail out over Germany. If they survived, they became a prisoner of war. The Germans, thinking that the codographs were a toy or a charm of sorts, let the prisoners keep them, not realizing what they really were. Inside the POW camps, escape plans and intelligence gathering was passed along right under the nose of the Germans without them knowing it. And that's how Captain Midnight did his part to win World War II.